in pit lane brought to you by online invent and with thanks to our platinum star patreon supporters Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of In Pit Lane coming to you right across Melbourne and Geelong on Channel 31 and of course on the In Pit Lane YouTube channel for viewing on demand. Coming up a little bit later on in the program, our musical guests this, this week, they joined us many years ago on In Pit Lane from our old studio, the old little studio from oh, probably 2017 or something. They're called Gen 2 and uh, they're doing absolutely killing it at the moment on Spotify. We'll be finding out more about that later. They're going to play us out a little bit later. Later, if you like your music, uh, you like your music uh, original, hard, heavy, and all the rest of it, they're going to be giving us some. Uh basically NTV unplugged tonight. So Gen Two unplugged a little bit later on in the program. Now joining us on the program, as you probably saw, I'm not alone on the uh, on the desk, of course. As per usual, I've got my offside, a Mr. Craig Doc Gladigo alongside me. But alongside of him is our special guest tonight. You know that over the years that we've uh, been here on In Pit Lane, that we've uh, we've regularly spoken to the CEO of uh, the artist formerly known as Cams. We go right back to the, uh, Peter Hanson and Rob Nethercote, and more recently, of course, Eugenia Rocker joined us on many occasions over the last few few years. But tonight, our special guest is the uh, the brand new CEO of Cams. We've given him a few months to sort of get his feet under the table, but uh, he's going to join us for the whole show. So no news tonight because we've got so much to talk about. Please welcome to In Pit Lane, the CEO of Motorsport Australia. He is Sunil Vora. Sunil, welcome to In Pit Lane. Thank you, Brett. Nice to be here. Hi, Doc. Nice to see you. It's Thank a real you. pleasure to be on the show for the first time. Well, let's talk about, quickly, uh, we've got so much to talk about, but let's find out a bit more about uh, about you. Your predecessor, of course, uh, Eugenia Rocker, came from a, a sports administration background, of course, with the AFL, and uh, brought a lot of the, that to the to the position. That's not your uh, that's not your background, though. Uh, so how did you come to uh, to get into this position, and what is your background? Well, so my background is uh, is more of commercial uh, uh, working around insurance and risk management. Um, I've spent many years working with some of the big insurers, some of the big financial services firms, both here in Australia. And then I, I lived for a long time in the UK and did a lot of work there uh, with a lot of financial services firms. So I come from a, a, a people risk specialism around risk management with some of the insurers. And that's been my uh, corporate background. I've also done some consulting work. But I got a, I got a phone call uh, Oh, middle of last year, maybe just after Eugene made his announcement, where I think uh, they were just uh, combing the landscape to see who might be interested in uh, in potentially coming to, to have a chat about becoming the new chief executive. When you officer. got that phone call, were you overseas or in Australia? I was at the time? in Australia. I was in Melbourne where I live. I was home. Uh, got the phone call, and I think my exact words were: "I said we're recruiting for the new CEO. Are you interested?" And I think my exact words were: "Well, I'm not not interested." But it hadn't really been on my radar as something to do. But I think they had understood, uh, and potentially someone, had, I don't really know how they got my details, potentially somebody had put, put my name forward. But I think the combination of having uh, a background around some you know, big ASX work, insurance and risk, corporate governance, consulting and strategic change, plus knowing that I'm an active motorsport competitor and have a sort of a lifelong connection to motorsport, those sort of th things came together and somebody thought, well, maybe he's worth a chat. Because that was the thing, I mean, you know, like in the early days with Eugene, I mean, we'd, we'd get all the time, oh, this guy doesn't, what does he know? He doesn't, he's not a motorsport person, he's, he's you know, football rubbish and all the rest of it. They forgot but, he was a lawyer, though. Yeah, but <laughs> you, you also, but you, as you say, you are a competitor. And uh, so so uh, what, do, what do you race? I mean, you've just recently been over the bend racing over there. So what do I, you race and how did you get into it? I have. I originally, actually, I've been, uh, well, a lifelong lover of motorsport. I think I grew up watching touring cars back as it was back in the day as a, you know, as a, as a, as a kid back in the 80s and to the 90s, t clocked into Formula One uh, and followed that, obviously, uh, you know, all, all my life. 
Uh, and I think like a lot of people, that interest and in the sport becomes something where you then you go see some races and then you have also maybe an interest in performance cars and automotive and things like that. And at some point you end up on a track in a car, right? And so I think that's not an untypical journey. For me, it then became about, well, this is fun, but maybe testing yourself a little bit with, uh, with competition would be interesting. And in fact, for me, firstly, that was actually with motorbikes. I raced motorbikes when I lived in the UK. First, it was my first competition experience was, um, I look back on it now and think that wasn't really the smartest thinking, but it was with a quite powerful 1,000cc uh, super stock bike racing British You've got all your digits and limbs. So you're I have, I've got a big scar on the back of my shoulder that you can't see it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, there's, so I, I raced bikes for about eight years, had a great time. I mean, just absolutely loved competition, loved doing that. But also I often say bike races are some of the best risk managers you'll ever meet because we're quite instantly deciding to what extent do you want to, you know, turn the throttle versus apply the brake uh, in every single situation. And the same applies for car racing, obviously. These days, I'm a little bit more sensible. I race with something that has a cage in it. I've got a 997 Gen 2 Porsche Cup car. It's just on 10 years old now. It's still pretty quick. Mm. It's uh, quite tricky to drive. It's a sequential, left-hand drive sequential gearbox, clutch pedal work uh, on the downshifts, uh, obviously rear engine, still you know, light, downforce, good power, amazingly good fun. But a, a challenge, and I think that's part of the part of the enjoyment of, um, of of amateur racing is you get to kind of test yourself a little bit, not just in terms of can you get to grips with the car and can you find a way to improve lap time, but also then when you go door to door racing, you know, putting yourself in competition with others is just spectacularly good fun. And I so really what enjoy do you think it. that experience behind the wheel and as a grassroots competitor, you know? adds to your position as, as CEO of Motorsport Australia, because that's one of the things, I mean, when we put out that you were coming on the program, a lot of the comments that we got, we got a few questions, but we got lots and lots of comments, and they were all basically along the, oh, yeah, Motorsport Australia couldn't care less about the grassroots, don't care about the, the you're a grassroots competitor, so mm -hmm. do you think that's going to, you know, help sort of open up that communication and, you know, to, with, with, the, with the rank and file of the, of the organisation rather than just the top end of town? I think, so I think the answer is yes, and I think I'm actually uh, understanding that more uh, now that I'm just on six months in the role. So I think in my early days, my perception was it was just an interesting footnote, if you like, that I, I had competition experience and I, I was a racer. I thought people will go, well, that's nice, but you know, he's there to be the administrator and, and run the administrative organisation. But actually, straight away, it changed the dynamic, I think, in terms of how people engage with me, and that is also from grassroots all the way through to the professional level sport. I have, you know, multiple supercar champions, um, the top level of motorsport, even in the Formula One, who speak to me in a different way because I think I understand the sport and see, see uh, me as just another racer um, who has uh, a love and a genuine interest in going quick. I think where it will be interesting and where I'm increasingly seeing it come to bear is in the discussions that we have uh, with the team at Motorsport Australia, I'm often bringing the perspective of competitor-led racing. You know, amateur racing is competitor-led, right? We, we pay our own money to go racing. We fund our own setup. And really that perspective now is potentially a new perspective in some of the discussions that we're having. And so I think that's where the value will come. We'll, fi we'll find out more about that in a moment. Also, we'll have a look at uh, where Motorsport Australia is at the moment and where you're going in the future. We're going to take a break now here on In Pit Lane. When we come back, we'll have more from our special guest tonight, the CEO of Motorsport Australia, Sunil Vora, and music from Gen 2 just around the corner. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Get the phone ringing for your business with website development and SEO services from Online Invent. Visit onlineinvent.com.au. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, thank you to uh, thank you to our friends at Online Invent for uh, making this program possible. We really do uh, we really do appreciate. As we say every week, if you're doing anything at all online, you really need to get it done properly. There's no point sort of doing this sort of thing half-assed and getting all sorts of you know messed up uh, messed up websites. Just uh, talk to Roy and the team at Online Invent. They can uh, make sure that whatever your uh, your your online uh, marketing is, that it's going to be done properly because it is very important. That's your uh, your window to the world at the moment. That's where it's sort of yeah you know, so much of your uh, so much of your business and so much of your communication is coming from is online. If you don't get it right, um, then it, it can be uh, it can make your uh, your business or your uh, your car club or whatever you're you're promoting your race team look very very second rate and very amateurish indeed. So uh, if you need any help, 
uh, the, the good thing about online invent is, um, you know, well, like, like Sunil was saying, like Roy is a hardcore motorsport enthusiast, knows what he's talking about, and uh, he'll he speaks your language. So uh, if you need anything like that, con contact uh, Online Invent. They're uh, online, onlineinvent.com.au, and you can uh, find out more about them. Now, we are, uh, tonight, our music, a special bonus for you watching uh, live on Facebook, also on the Infit Lane YouTube channel, is our band tonight. They are Gen 2. They can be found at Spotify. They're on Linktree. If you want to find out all the links, they're on Facebook and Instagram. But right now, they're going to play us with the first song for the night. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gen 2 and Bitter and Twisted. <laughs> Is it being bitter and twisted? 
Welcome back to In Pit Lane here on Channel 31. Now, our guest tonight, of course, is the CEO of Motorsport Australia, Sunil Vora. And Sunil, you, of course, you, you mentioned your background in insurance, which is you know, interesting in light of the, the figures that we've just recently seen from Motorsport Australia. Um, the the, the organisation running it basically you know, last year operated at a, at a loss, if you are just, just around, a, just over a million dollars. A big slab of that was insurance. Now, this isn't a, just a problem for our for our sport. This seems to be a problem. It's a problem for pretty much every sport in Australia. Also, for our, you know, for people like our band tonight, uh, Gen Two, and all the other live music that comes on the program, music venues, festivals, all the rest are shutting down everywhere because of the ridiculous cost of insurance. What the hell can we do about it? Well, you're absolutely right, Brett. It is a global problem. A lot of it is uh, stemmed by the current macroeconomic conditions that the world finds itself in, and that flows through to insurance. Essentially, in somewhere deep uh, in the um, in the deep in the basement in Lloyd's of London, there's people working out how much capital they're going to apply for different insurance products around the world and where they apply it in a way that gives best return on that capital. And there's a lot of calculations that go on. If I try and explain it, well, firstly, I'll get us lost because I probably won't do it correctly. Uh, but it really goes through a series of calculations to be able to determine where do they want to apply that capital. And they go through cycles. And we're in what's called the hard cycle at the moment, quite deep in it, which means that not as much capital is available for insurance programs globally. And those that are at the slightly riskier profile, that capital is even more expensive than it used to be. So we're currently in a situation where that cycle is playing out. What we're looking to do is try and accelerate the pace at which we can move to what's called a softer cycle, where more capital comes, becomes a little bit cheaper, and that flows through to underwriting and then to premiums. What about the bigger picture? Like in New Zealand, I mean, they've, they've covered this to an extent. They had a, a big problem years ago, and essentially what they did is they brought together, you know, under the government, they brought together a nationalised scheme, that, you know, a sort of a, a no-fault uh, scheme over there that, you know, basically saved a lot of sports, including motorsport. There was a, a brief period of time when a lot of the officials wouldn't go out because we just we just don't have insurance. So, you know, is, is, there, a, is there a role for government... To, to take in this, or are we in a situation where you know the insurance companies are just so big and powerful in Australia that you know all hell would break loose if they ever turned around and said, "No, nah, let's um, let's basically take some control of this." So I think there's something in what are the different models that insurers or that organisations can look for around finding an answer. So that the the example you talk of in New Zealand with the ACC it was run by Scott Pickering, who used to be. Uh, in Lords of London and went over back to, to New Zealand where he was originally from and created that model or helped create a model that was more scaled than it was previously. And as you say, it was a great model that worked well. We're a little bit different in Australia. It's bigger. It's, we're federated, obviously, with a different structure. They have a different government model over there. So it's a little bit simpler. What we are looking to do, though, is to say, are there opportunities for us to outperform the rate cycle so that we can give the underwriters information they don't currently have about our forward view and not just rely on claims history to improve our premium position for the coming renewal year. So I'm quite actively involved in that now. We're midway through briefing underwriters in London virtually and then in person we're doing that next month to be able to talk to them about the ability to apply essentially a discount to what the actuaries otherwise say. The other things that we could do if we get further down the track and we don't find the relief that we're looking for, you can look to things like essentially provisioning part of the insurance layers to say, could we as motorsport or could we, in, with all the other disciplines of motorsport, because it's a common problem across uh, the Australian Motorsport Council talks about this constantly, with all the disciplines of motorsport to say, are there things that we could do to try and pool risk, pool capital, self-insure a layer, and then only use uh, the insurance product and the underwritten product when it's more significant in terms of... Because, of course, the claims. downside of all this is a lot of grassroots competitors are saying, you know, th this is becoming crazy, you know, we've become safety mad. I mean, in terms of, you know, what we've got to do with our cars, there's, you know, edicts coming out from the FIA in France about things they've got to change in their cars, things they've got to change in terms of getting in and out of their cars for a lot of older drivers. That's become a real mm -hmm. a real source of uh, problem. I mean, you know, can you go too far? I mean, can, can you make the sport too, too safe? I mean... You know, like we, I always used to close the show with the with, with the do. You know, remember, motor racing is dangerous. Let's keep it that way. Um, are we moving too far the other way? Uh, I don't think so. I think, look, in theory, yeah, sure, it's possible to go. Well, what's the safest form of motorsport? We don't go racing, but that doesn't sound right. Motorsport has an inherent risk to it. We all know that, right? We, it's about what do we do that are sensible things to try and mitigate and prevent incident. To use risk management speak, how do you reduce the frequency of incident? And some of the things that you see coming through are simply a, a constant evolution of that process. Things like self-instruction that you quite rightly mentioned is an FIA standard that's been used globally for years. Like if you go racing in the UK, 
spend 10 seconds um, on self-extraction for years on every category, no exceptions. Here, we've delayed bringing that in. We brought it in much later and we've given it a five second leeway to say it's 15 seconds for this first year. We'll have a look at it over, over, the, um, over the January period to say, does that then reduce to the FI standard of 10 years? And if you think of what's the point of it, the point of it is that we practice getting ourselves out of our vehicles faster because the first time you do it in a hurry, you don't want it to be in an emergency situation where you've got fire or you've got risk or you're stranded somewhere. You want to, what we found in all the testing around self-extraction is that competitors get significantly faster the more they practice it. That's the entire point of, uh, of, this, um, of this edict. And it's the entire point of what the officials and the scrutineers are trying to do. We're trying to get people better at doing it. And so that the first time they do it, or, or the, when they do it, when it matters, it's not the first time that they've had to practice getting out in a hurry. You've had a bit of a handover from Eugene back at the start. You've had your boots on the ground for a while now. Transferring all this we've been talking about, I mean, you, I'll, I'll quote you for a second. Um, you're always trying to do more than resourced, and that is Motorsport Australia. You've always been, had the fabric always been pull, pulled from pillar to post with you. Um, how hard is the risk versus governance at the moment then? Because you obviously are trying to satisfy a lot of people. Well, it's a complex sport, isn't it? There's a lot of stakeholders. I think that's certainly my observation in the first six months is that coming into a sport that has the breadth that we do is part of the appeal, right? It's exciting that we get to work across all the different disciplines, all the different you know, locations, all the different formats of motorsport, that's really good fun rather than it just being one category or one thing. But that complexity means that the, you know, the risk profiles are different, the way that we would then apply different rules, regs, tech specs, the way that we would support with officials, um, with, with media, with structures to be able to help different events run. Um, it's clearly something that we have to make trade-offs and choices as to how we might do things and what is the best use of the resource that we have. I'd love to always be able to do more. We're going to take a break again. We're, again, we're going through very quickly. We've still got so much more to, uh, to talk about, but we'll be joined by uh, Sunil Vora more in uh, just a moment. And also to play us out tonight will be our band Gen 2. You're watching In Pit Lane. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Get the phone ringing for your business with website development and SEO services from Online Invent. Visit onlineinvent.com.au. Yes, uh, once again, thank you to, uh, to Online Invent. I uh, will be back with Sunil Lavora in just one second. Um, I just want to say, uh, as, as we've said before, in Pit Lane, we've got uh, about three shows to go in this particular series. Now, we are scheduled to come back a little bit later on in the year when basically uh, like, things get a bit quiet in Melbourne over the, uh, over the winter period, but we, will, uh, we are scheduled to come back in, uh, in September here in the studio. That will be, of course, once again, uh, reliant on us finding some sponsorship and some support. As we've said in the, in the past, um, the program, you know, nobody gets paid on the program, but there are, there are costs involved. There are many costs involved in putting the program together. And unless we can get support from both sponsors and also for those of you uh, through our Patreon as well, we thank the people who are supporting us now on Patreon from as little as $4 a month. If, you're in a, if you've got a business or you've got a, uh, got, got a club or something like that, $25 a month, you'll get your logo on the uh, start of the program and all the rest of it and our, our eternal thanks. So uh, that's, the, that's the idea. And during the break, incidentally, even though the program won't be on from the studio, there will still be lots and lots of things happening. We've got, uh, we've got the Winton Historics is coming up very soon. We've got a whole bunch of uh, things that we out shooting tomorrow. Uh, stay tuned on the Facebook page. If you're watching us on the Facebook page, tomorrow about 5, about 5.30 thereabouts major announcement coming tomorrow and we're going to try and live stream that from somewhere in melbourne can't say too much about it but tomorrow at about 5 30 a major announcement and we'll be streaming that hopefully on the youtube oh, sorry on the facebook page um but if if we don't you'll see it next week on the program somehow we never ever make it to those swiss alps or over to geneva or any of those wonderful no, places i've got, a, I've got a lovely view i've got a lovely view of lake oh, geneva you, from have, my, you do from have that the but, lane but the holidays never seem to eventuate we always end up seeing oh, uh, every God, week every weekend this. we find something that some yeah. motorsport come on come out there and we'll talk right, about yeah. that in just a moment yeah. as well with, with, with our guest Sunil Bora. but um once again thank you to online invent who have made uh, this season possible um thank you to our support supporters uh, from on Patreon but uh, as I said in order for us to come back we do need some support coming up and uh, it's not like there's a lot of sport there's a lot of sports here on channel 31 they get you know they get a lot of money a lot of support um, we're not one of them unfortunately so just uh, if you want us back we would love to come back uh, later on in the year 
Welcome back to In Pit Lane. Our special guest tonight is the CEO of Motorsport Australia, Sunil Vora. And Sunil, we've, I knew that we'd run out of time already, but just quickly, when you were coming on the program, we, we asked a few people about uh, you know, questions and things they wanted to raise. We had a lot of feedback from our volunteer marshals. We got you know, them they're on our backdrop again tonight. One of the one of the questions that uh, one of the issues that was raised constantly and that was raised by Suzanne when she came mm -hmm. in on the program a couple of weeks ago was the increasing demands on the time factor for for, for marshals. They're getting the, the, the earlier and earlier calls in the morning, later and later days. They're starting at five, six o'clock in the morning, going through till six, seven o'clock at night, mm. and sometimes three or four. People can't afford that anymore. I mean, what can Motorsport Australia do to, to, to you know, make things a lot easier for the officials? So I appreciate the question, and I've had lots of questions like that. I think we, we've been through an exercise that's taken the last few months um, to uh, survey and scan the officials' community uh, to be able to bring in a whole bunch of intel. It's been under the guise of what's called the Officials Working Group. It was chaired by Ed Ordinsky, rally legend, who actually dedicated his time, volunteered to be able to help us put together quite a, a structured program around just getting intel. What are the issues? Length of days, uh, volume of events, number of categories running, all these things that we know of. And there's also things like training, renewal, recruitment, culture, uh, all the different things that relate to um, you know, high performance and an enjoyable experience for people who otherwise are volunteering their time. We've got 37 recommendations to be able to work through. What I'm pleased to also say is that structurally we're addressing this with Motorsport Australia with the new safety and technical director coming in who has enormous experience around uh, officials and volunteers and how the sporting element of how we go racing. Lisa Crampton is coming back to Melbourne from where she's been in Europe now for the last 18 years or so. Yes, so she's, we'll certainly be asking for her to come yeah, on the program so later on in the year too. <laughs> she will take carriage of being able to address a lot of these issues. So rather than it just being about, well, you know, take us saying platitudes like, you know, take breaks or, you know, you know, skip events or things like that, I think we have to structurally acknowledge that these are challenging times. Volunteerism is a challenge for many organisations and we have to really lean into this to say, well, how can we structurally solve some of these issues but also provide the opportunity for pathways, renewal, and get back to the enjoyment where you know, I was, you know, you see them, 966 volunteers at the Grand Prix had the most amazing time, were utterly exhausted at the end of these incredibly long days. Um, but it was an amazing experience to see. And we see that constantly throughout the motorsport community at all the events that happen every weekend. I think there's more we can do. We're structurally trying to address it and we've got some great intel from the volunteer community. Speaking of structure, I know you've got a strategic plan for this year, next year. Um, I'm told that uh, on the side that you said 25s also and 26 and so forth. You've also got key pillars. One of all this big chunk of all these plans and strate strategic uh, implements is going to be the home of motorsport out mm -hmm. in the western suburbs. So your feas the feasibility outlook on that is obviously, I think you're, uh, mem you've got numbers, sustainability, environment, you want to be a hub, um, inclusiveness, participation. It's meeting all that criteria. How's it looking on the funding issue? Because that's the big elephant in everyone's room everyone's been asking lately. Well, it's a very big challenge in Victoria at the moment to get government funding for major infrastructure investment. I think people know that. I think the circumstances have changed fiscally for Victoria from when this was originally conceived back in 22. In fact, it's, not a, it's, it's an idea that's been around for, for a few years, actually. But the, the idea to, to base it next to Avalon Airport uh, and use the government gave some funds to be able to do a business case development process, which just came to an end in February put the business case into Treasury. We worked very hard across the Minister and across the Department who are very supportive. It's just hard to get funding at the moment. So we're looking, so we didn't, we weren't successful with the Victorian budget last week. We've got uh, other options that we're playing out with the Victorian government about how we can try and still work towards achieving this. Because the end goal really is, if Motorsport Australia has a facility where we can 365 days a year help grow the sport, help encourage participation and very much give an opportunity for clubs volunteers circuit, uh, for um, amateur racing to have somewhere to have a home, it's uh, much better than where we currently sit. Look, I knew we'd run out of time so so quickly. Sunil, thank you. Hopefully uh, later on, if we, if we come back later on in the year, we'll be able to catch up for a little bit more. Um, and as I said, when uh, Lisa comes on board, we'd certainly love, because if you don't know her, uh, her background is, is, is in qu quite incredible and she would be a great guest on the program. Thank you for coming on there. We had, as I said, we had a fabulous relationship with you, Gina, over the years. Hopefully we'll have the same for in the years to come with you. But for now, Sunil Vora, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Thanks so much. Love to come back next time. Thank you. And thank you to you for joining us at home. Playing us out tonight is Gen 2. You can find them at Spotify, Inc. Linktree, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and they're going to play us out right now with O-I-S-O-S. -S. Good night.
living, a learning, a loving, a yearning, a sight to behold with the eye of my mind, a standing sensation of my own creation, vision of being that's too hard to find, stopping and staring, singles and pairings, standing in judgment, assessing the scene of mayhem and chaos, simple and fast, but knowing the future, the guy in the past, marching to the beat of a different drum. Freedom or burden, it's yours to decide. No money, no power, no mind games, no sign. Definitive choice, no station in time. Mass expectation, unfettered frustration. Same situation, again and again. It's a fluid transition, a juxtaposition. It's my universe, get out of my head. Marching to the beat of a different drum. Passing you by. It's all about him. 